Hello everyone. So this lecture is targeting non-ICU trained medical staff that is likely to be involved in the management of ICU patients during this COVID-19 pandemic. It is going to be a simple lecture, uh, but really I'm, I'm just trying to deliver the core concepts here and the pathophysiology behind um, the respiratory failure. So we start from here. Oxygen is in the air as well as nitrogen. So we have oxygen and nitrogen mainly in the air and we know that the pressure that is generated by this molecule, uh, so the total pressure is equal to the sum of the pressures generated by each type of molecule. So let's say if you have a container and you have just oxygen and nitrogen, your pressure inside that container will be equal to the pressure generated by the molecules of oxygen plus the pressure generated by the molecule of nitrogen. And we know that oxygen is 21% uh, of the total volume in the atmosphere so and we also know that the pressure the atmospheric pressure at sea level is 101.3 kilopascal so if you put all this together the partial pressure of oxygen is equal 101.3 multiplied by 0.21 so 21 percent of the total pressure so the partial pressure of oxygen is 21 percent of the total pressure so this is the value of the partial pressure of oxygen at sea level 21.3 kilopascal so this is what we breathe we breathe this kind of pressure of oxygen so from here um, oxygen then goes into our lungs where it gets uh, mixed with CO2 coming from here and um, vapor and therefore there are other gases here, other molecules and so the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli this capital A is alveoli is lower than the partial pressure of oxygen in air. So you have the partial pressure of oxygen in air is 21.3 and then when it gets into the lungs, into, into the alveoli, it becomes 14.2 and from here um, it goes into the arterial blood and it drops again. Here it drops because you always have a little bit of shunt between the right um, the, le uh, the right and the left heart. So the partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries, that's the um, low case A, is 13.3 kilopascal. So as you notice, there is a cascade of oxygen pressures uh, from the air, from the atmosphere, um, all the way down to the bloodstream to the arteries and then it goes to the tissues here. So from this graph uh, we understand two things. The first is that we know now we can understand why people that try to climb Mount Everest die. It's not really because they fall from a cliff, it's mainly due to the fact that their partial pressure of oxygen at that altitude is very low. So they have very, very minimal reserve and therefore um, should they, you know, have a strenuous uh, exercise, their um, oxygen reserve is very minimal and therefore they go into hypoxemia and hypoxia. So that's the first thing. Interesting. The second thing here to notice is that we have a significant reserve uh, of oxygen flowing through the uh, arteries. Uh, because really the tissues require um, only a fraction of the oxygen that flows into the arteries. Uh, 
So that's called the oxygen cascade. The pressure of oxygen up here um, reduces over um, the the over the, the the different passages. So this is a simplified version of the system. And in the human system, you have two uh, places where you get uh, gas exchange. One is here at the alveolar capillary level in the lungs. You have a gas exchange and then the other gas exchange happens here at the capillary level in the tissues. So to understand how the system works up here, if you want to know if the system is working fine, you want to assess the outcome of the system. And so if you want to see if the lungs are able to oxygenate the blood, you want to look at the amount of oxygen that is contained in the arterial blood. And that is why we define respiratory failure by a failure of maintaining normal arterial blood gas partial pressure. So this means that if the lungs are unable to maintain a normal arterial blood gas partial pressure um, of oxygen, then there is a failure of the system. Okay, and that is the reason why we take an arterial blood sample when uh, we want to measure the partial pressure of oxygen to, to see if there is a respiratory failure. Now, failure is defined when the partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries is below 8 kilopascal. Now, this 8 um, looks like a magic number. The reason for it is that um, you have your oxygen dissociation curve where um, you see here the curve really starts to descend very quickly below um, a partial pressure of oxygen, of oxygen of 8 kilopascal. So when you get to 8, really it becomes very easy to desaturate hemoglobin. And this is relevant because oxygen delivery is given by the cardiac output multiplied by the arterial content of oxygen. So this is the main equation in human physiology, really. This is the, maybe the most important equation to understand. The oxygen delivered to the cells. Okay, so the oxygen that delivers, that's delivered to the cells is equal to the amount of blood that leaves the heart every minute multiplied by the amount of oxygen contained in that blood. Okay, so if you let this equation explode here, your cardiac output is stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate multiplied by the arterial content of oxygen, which is the oxygen saturating hemoglobin molecules plus the oxygen dissolved in, in the plasma. Now this part is very, is very low. There is a very minimal amount of blood dissolved in plasma. But the main carrier of oxygen is hemoglobin. So if your oxygen saturation drops, you have a problem in oxygen delivery. So that is the reason why if you have a failure in the system here of the lungs and you're unable to oxygenate the blood then you are unable to saturate the hemoglobin and therefore your oxygen delivery will be diminished a low oxygen delivery could result in hypoxemia or sorry in hypoxia hypoxia mean uh, low oxygen in, in the tissue. Hypoxemia means low oxygen in the blood. So there you have it. That is the reason why we define respiratory failure um, as a failure to maintain normal arterial blood gas partial pressure below 8 kilopascal.
So we have two, uh, two pathophysiological mechanisms really um, that define respiratory failure. One is the failure to ventilate. Okay, we have a ventilation problem. So the air does not move in and out as it should. And the other pathophysiological mechanism is a diffusion problem. So the oxygen is unable to diffuse properly between the alveoli and the capillaries. So we call this ventilation failure and we call this diffusion failure. Now, I know some of you have studied respiratory failure in terms of type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure or um, similar. In reality, I like, I like to teach it in, in this way because it, it comes more natural to understand. But if you want, you can see this one, the ventilation um, failure, as a type 2 respiratory failure because when you have a ventilation problem you are unable to mobilize your co2 from your lungs properly and therefore you'll have an accumulation of co2 in the bloodstream and that will lead to respiratory acidosis okay so let's briefly go and explore the t the ventilation failure now ventilation failure can be due to a variety of causes and you can start from the top from the brain you could have a failure in the respiratory uh, neurons okay so you don't breathe properly because your neurons that trigger your breathing efforts are not uh, working properly properly and that could be related to an increased CO2 level, so that's called hypercapnia, and that can lead to hypercapnic coma. You could have drugs that can impair your brain activity, so morphine or hypnotics, and you have several conditions that can lead to a failure of the respiratory neurons, so increased intracranial pressure, stroke, trauma, and tumors. So we move down and we look at the other causes here. So a uh, problem with the upper motor neurons. And here uh, mainly the main reason for respiratory failure due to this lesion is a, is a fracture of C3, C4 trauma. A fracture of C3, C4 results in um, in failure of the phrenic nerve and the phrenic nerve is the nerve that uh, innervates the diaphragm as you know so if you have a failure of the diaphragm you have a ventilation problem other condition that could lead to an upper motor neuron uh, disruption are tumors demyelination and syringomyelia then you go down to the anterior horn cell and here you have the anterior horn cell syndrome or um, another condition is called polyomyelitis then you go down to the lower motor neurons and here again the main reason for lesion here is surgery trauma and a rare uh, condition is Guillain-Barré you come down to the neuromuscular junction and here, the main culprit of respiratory failure at the neuromuscular junction is myasthenia gravis. Other causes include botulism, neuromuscular blocking agents, and organophosphorus compounds. Then we move to the muscles. And here, um, the main reason is atrophy or myopathy. So here, uh, this is relevant when we discuss patients who are receiving mechanical ventilation for long term. Patients who are mechanically ventilated for days and who have received uh, muscle relaxants can develop an atrophy of the muscular fibers. 
This is a problem because when you try to wean them from the ventilator and extubate them, um, you, you find them in a respiratory failure due to ventilation problem because the muscles that you know help the breathing like the diaphragm or the intercostal muscles are atrophic or uh, myopathic. Other conditions include a COPD and a low cardiac output. This is important because when you have a, your intensive care patient who has a cardiogenic or in general a circulatory shock uh, and they have a low cardiac output, this can lead to a lower, um, uh, lower blood supply to the muscles and therefore muscle fatigue and that's why then they get tired and they can't uh, sustain a proper ventilation. From here, we move to the loss of elasticity of the wall or the parenchyma. And here the conditions are pulmonary fibrosis, empyema, kyphoscoliosis, burn scars, or even mild pressure applied from outside. Then we move to the loss of structural integrity. Here, uh, the main cause is uh, trauma of the rib cage that results in something that it's called flailed segment. Flailed segment is when the ribs break uh, in two points uh, across several levels and therefore you have a part of the thorax or the rib cage that is not uh, in continuity with the rest and therefore you have a paradoxical uh, movement of the wall at that level and therefore uh, that area is insufficient um, so the ventilation of that area is, is uh, not adequate. Last but not least, you have your airway obstruction. And here is divided with between upper airways when you have infections, tumors or foreign bodies and small airway obstruction. And those are your three main diseases, asthma, COPD and cystic fibrosis. Obviously, our airway obstruction is the main reason for ventilation failure. So there you have it. That's a nice overview of the um, causes of ventilation failure that lead to respiratory failure. Let's move to the second part. Diffusion problem. When you talk about diffusion problem, we talk about the alveolus. And here we have a very sad alveolus. <laughs> Has many problems. We have a problem here in the alveolus. We can have a problem between the alveolus and the capillary. Or we can have a problem in the capillaries. So the blood supply. Let's explore the three options here. If we have a vascular problem, it can either be coming from the right heart, so low blood supply coming from the right heart to the lungs, and so we have an obstruction to the flow, and we call this pulmonary embolism, where we have an increase of the dead space, or a problem uh, with the left heart, so the blood does not flow properly from the alveolus or from the lung to uh, the left heart. So you have an increased uh, pressure across these capillaries and we call this pulmonary edema. So then uh, the fluid then leaks out into the interstitial space and then can flow into the alveolus itself. The problem uh, in the interstitial space mainly is uh, related to fibrosis. And fibrosis, as you know, uh, is uh, an irregular thickened tissue between the alveoli that leads to a problem in diffusion. You can imagine the normal wall of the alveolus is, is thin, uh, but when you have this kind of picture, the distance between the alveolus and the capillary increases and therefore the diffusion is impaired. This is the typical picture on the chest X-ray and those are your causes. It could be drugs, 
it could be dust, it could be infection, so it could be autoimmune. Now, uh, talking about this uh, COVID-19 disease, um, the picture that are shown uh, on the CT uh, show an interstitial, um, an interstitial problem as well. So the picture that is correlated to the infection, the viral infection of the coronavirus is a one of an interstitial uh, ARDS, acute respiratory, acute respiratory uh, distress syndrome. Now, the problem of the alveolus itself can be divided into, t into three uh, mechanisms. One is an obstruction of the very small uh, bron bronchi, the terminals. So when you have this problem here that could be due to secretion, tumors, bleeding, or aspiration, then you have a reabsorption of oxygen from the alveolus itself into the capillaries, and this will cause shrinking of the alveoli. So you have a collapse of the alveoli that are obstructed. So we call this uh, atelectasis. Second mechanism is filling the alveolus with secretion or fluid or whatever. It could be either due to pneumonia or we could do to um, a cytokine response uh, to an infection. Let's say a virus, you know, you have a virus that is infecting, it is uh, attaching to the receptors in the small airways and into the alveoli, and then it's entering the cells here, it's replicating, it's replicating, it's disrupting the barrier, and it's generating a lot of inflammation. All this inflammation then fills in the alveoli and fills with fluid and, and secretions. So, and that's generalized across the lungs. So you would have this picture of um, acute respiratory distress syndrome where the virus causes secretions and fluid into the alveoli all across the lung. And more on, uh, on top of that, you'll have an interstitial uh, inflammation as well. So that is what seems to be the, um, the picture of this viral infection due to coronavirus. The third mechanism here is uh, a, an external force, force that causes the alveoli to collapse. So in this case, it could either be a pneumothorax or an effusion, so a plural, plural effusion. You have fluid or air around the alveoli and those exert a force that collapses the alveoli and you have atelectasis here as well. So what would you do in case you have a respiratory failure? Now of course you have to do your normal things so you first uh, try to make a diagnosis and then after that you start to treat with whatever you need to treat and but then really at one stage you have to support um, the function of the lungs because um, differently from other organ failures if you have a respiratory failure you don't really have much of a reserve there because you don't really have oxygen reserves in your body so if your lungs fail you really need to support to support them quite quite early so you do your diagnosis you start your treatments you start i don't know your antibiotics or whatnot but then at the same time you have to start supporting the function and the first thing you do really when you have uh, a patient that is evolving into a respiratory failure you start by giving oxygen now oxygen um, it tends to mask the problem because of course you're improving the oxygenation, but you're masking the problem because you're not addressing the cause of the failure. You're just buying time. But again, it is important to buy time because you want to understand where you're going and you want to see whether the patient recovers. Uh, 
whether the body reacts to the treatment that you're given. Maybe you have started antibiotics and maybe you want to wait to see uh, whether the patient responds to the antibiotics on their own and they recover without needing uh, extra invasive measures. So you buy some time by giving extra oxygen. Hmm. Now, uh, in this uh, virus that we are talking about, the coronavirus, um, the evolution of the disease is quite rapid in uh, a cohort of patients. So uh, really, yes, you start with the oxygen, but then there is no specific treatment. Uh, the treatment is supportive and you just have to observe the evolution or the patient trajectory. So you have to optimize all the functions and you have to um, give oxygen and you have to observe the patient trajectory and monitor whatever is happening in this patient. So you monitor clinically uh, their respiratory function, their respiratory rate, their level of distress, their heart rate, their blood pressure, and all the parameters really. You monitor those over time and you see how it goes. And if the patient then, uh, if the patient's trajectory is obviously going into um, a failure, then what is recommended here for the COVID-19 is an early aggressive management because again, there are no uh, known uh, specific treatment for this. Obviously, it is a primary viral pneumonia. Uh, therefore, um, it cannot really be treated um, uh, with specific treatments. Um, so there are some treatments in trial now, but uh, nothing really has been found to stop the infection in the early stage. So what you do here is you give oxygen, you monitor the trend, and if you see that the patient is going into respiratory failure, and you do that by taking an arterial blood gas sample, and you measure the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood, you then, uh, uh, you then interact with your anesthetics and then uh, it is them to come and review the overall picture and decide whether the management is going to be one of uh, aggressive management, in, i.e. intubation and mechanical ventilation. It is uh, recommended uh, in this cohort of patients uh, suffering from COVID-19 to treat with early rather than late intubation. It is uh, recommended not to start um, uh, non-invasive ventilation uh, in when the picture is obvious. So when the picture is obviously one of a patient that is rapidly going in respiratory failure, and the picture on the chest x-ray is bad, then really it has been shown that trying non-invasive ventilation doesn't really help uh, because eventually they will need the tube. So, but that again, it will be a decision made by the anesthetic team or the critical care team. Uh, from your point of view, uh, you have to support the patient, um, give oxygen and monitor the trend. And then if the patient is developing a respiratory failure, then you call your anesthetist or intensivist and they will come and assess and review and judge whether mechanical ventila ventilation is indicated. Mechanical ventilation really, it's something that might seem intimidating, but in reality, what we do here is pumping air into the patient's lungs. That's what we do. You have a ventilation problem here, and we take over that problem by ventilating the patient ourselves with the machine. So you resolve the ventilation problem by ventilating the patient with volumes that you decide, and you try to resolve the diffusion problem by increasing the pressures 
within the alveoli and by opening the alveoli the alveoli that were collapsed in a way that the diffusion of oxygen between the alveoli and the capillaries improves so mechanical ventilation really treat, treats both treat, treats both types of uh, respiratory failure the ventilation failure and the diffusion failure so this is how it's done you connect a pump or a ventilator to the patient's lungs through a tube and then the air gets pumped in and then out of the patient. We do have some settings. We do set the tidal, we can set the tidal volume, we can set the respiratory rate, we can set the inspiration to expiration ratio. Uh, that's to treat the respiratory, sorry, the ventilatory failure. And if we want to increase the pressures in the airways, especially in the small areas, then we go ahead and play with other uh, numbers such as the airway pressures or the positive and expiratory pressure, the P pressure. Okay, And obviously we can always change the FiO2 and bring it up and down. But as I said, really giving oxygen is really to buy time and it does mask the problem. So the patient is more oxygenated and the number is better on the monitor, but you're not addressing the problem here only by giving oxygen. You need to give ventilation and you need to give pressure to open up the lungs again. So um, we do this with uh, invasive or non-invasive ventilation. As I said before, non-invasive ventilation is not really recommended in this COVID-19 pandemic um, for two reasons really. One is that um, when the patient is very sick or uh, the failure is established, then non-invasive ventilation doesn't really help. It actually delays the real uh, aggressive treatment of an invasive ventilation. And the other reason is that non-invasive ventilation generates aerosol uh, particles and therefore you'll have an increased risk for the uh, healthcare workers in the room. So, but again, I am not saying that non-invasive ventilation is contraindicated in COVID-19. I am just saying that the decision to start non-invasive ventilation has to be, um, has to be weighed up uh, between the pros and cons, so the benefits and the risks. Invasive ventilation is the definitive treatment for uh, an established respiratory failure, uh, especially if it's uh, secondary to an acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome. Invasive ventilation uh, is done by inserting a tube uh, between the vocal cords into the trachea and inflating a balloon that seals the tube uh, and it seals the airways from uh, the gastric content. So it, de it, it detaches the airways from the, uh, from the content of the, uh, from the gastric content. So you insert this tube, you inflate this cuff, and you connect the tube to a ventilator that pumps air into the lungs. With the tube, then you can generate high pressures into the lungs and um, and therefore you could treat or you could try to address the problem of alveolar collapse. So there you have it. That's really an overview of um, of mechanical, uh, sorry, of respiratory failure and principles of treatment. I, I am not going to discuss invasive ventilation today and I am not going to discuss the uh, ventilation strategies to respond to COVID-19. Uh, we will hopefully do that in another video. So uh, thank you for listening and take care.